tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. This episode of Horror Hill is brought to you by June's Journey. Find your first clue by downloading June's Journey today. Available on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as on PC through Facebook games. Listeners, and welcome back to Horror Hill. I'm your host, Eric Peabody, and we've got two spooky stories for you tonight. First, from Matt Howes, we have a delightful period piece titled The Sunken City. In the grand tradition of H.P. Lovecraft, our protagonist is hunting down rumors of a lost city in the uncharted waters off of southern Africa. It seems that new obstacles are popping up at every step of his journey, but he dauntlessly, and potentially foolishly, perseveres. What horrors await him in the sunken city? Will he be able to escape with his life? and his sanity intact? Who can tell? Following that, we have Road Killer by Getty Cahoon. Our story opens with our hero, and believe me, listener, I use that term loosely, named James, as he's extracting his shoe from some sun-baked roadkill on an empty stretch of highway in the desert. Poor James's car has broken down, and he's already late for an appointment with his ex-wife and his son, two people that James does not hold in high regard. Unfortunately for him, his troubles are just beginning. I love a story that has a solid piece of shit protagonist, and James is absolutely someone that I love to hate. Disclaimer, Horror Hill is a horror anthology podcast, bringing you scary stories from all corners of the internet. As such, certain stories include content that some listeners might find offensive. Listener discretion is advised. 
You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Did I mention they were ad-free? And now, from author Matt Howes, I give you The Sunken City. The Elder Ones persist, lying dormant in slumber, whilst their legion of servants grows in their number, waiting for their rising, their glorious return when the veil shall lift and the world shall burn. A city of stone lay somewhere in the ocean, lying just below the surface. Many have sought the city due to the legends that surround the treasure it hides. I myself have extensively researched the proposed location and have taken several excursions to potential sites of the fabled city. I studied all available geographical and topographical maps and sea charts, both recent and historical, to try and pinpoint the best place to begin my latest hunt for the city. Although fruitless in my labor, each expedition provided me with more rumors, folklore, and local tales, each fascinating in their varying degrees of speculation on what the treasure was. In some areas, the prevailing thesis was that the city was once occupied by a race of semi-fish people who hoarded gold and jewels from lost and sunken ships, their valuables waiting to be reclaimed from the depths. In other parts, they believed that the treasure was an ancient being who could grant the gift of knowledge to those wise and cunning enough to find him. In every case, they all agreed that the city was ancient in origin, and submerged deep beneath the waves. With further research and cross-referencing of the recorded tales and the information gathered on my travels, I had narrowed down what I suspected the location to be to a small area just south of the African coast. I booked myself on the first available ferry, which regrettably wasn't for another month, and began my preparations, inspecting and repairing the equipment that would be required for such a voyage. Shortly after my departure, once the ferry was well out to sea, I began asking a few of the other passengers native to Africa about their knowledge of the city. Nearly all were unaware, or claimed to be, of the existence of such a place, and one or two had nothing but vagaries and conjecture to offer. However, there was one gentleman, advanced in his years, with a look of vacancy in his eyes. His thoughts were a world away from his physical body, who had more to say on the subject than anyone else I had interviewed. We sat on the ferry deck, staring out to the sea as the gulls pursued the vessel, and he told me the tale of his brother, who once went looking for the city himself. At twenty-three, his brother had set out to find the fabled city and return with a fortune he had heard about from an old acquaintance. His brother had headed to the southernmost port of Africa, where he had convinced a local fisherman to ferry him to a nearby island just west of the port where an isolated tribe of indigenous people had established colony. Although they spoke no word of the same language, he had managed to convey the meaning of his journey through basic pictographs and rudimentary gestures. They, in turn, directed him to another nearby island through primitive maps etched upon dried tree bark and indicated a location with what appeared to be a drawing of an idol. This idol immediately struck fear into the young man, as the eldritch and unnatural shape of the figure contradicted all natural laws of physical being. At this point, his nerves faltered, and he nearly abandoned his quest and would have returned home there and then, had it not been for the strange shrine at the center of the native's camp. There... Placed around a rough representation of the same idol on the map, 
lay a wealth of gold and jewels the young man had only seen in picture books and stories of pirates and kings. This treasure hoard reinvigorated him, and he solidified his desire to find the fabled treasure. From that point, the details of the man's journey were unclear, as he had sent no further correspondence back to his brother after leaving the native island. It can be assumed, however, that he had continued to follow the trail indicated by the islanders. The old man suddenly turned to me, fear giving his eyes a clarity that had not been there before, and stared at me so intensely that I began to shuffle uncomfortably in my seat. In a voice almost unnaturally low and coarse, he warned me not to follow in his brother's footsteps and to avoid the native's island at all costs. Unsettling as the dialogue had been, it did not alter my determination to find the city for myself and discover the treasure. I thanked the gentleman for his time and cautionary words and left my room to think over my next course of action in peace until we arrived at our destination. Once we had safely arrived in the port in Africa, I immediately headed for the nearest tavern, hoping to find some fisherman or entrepreneur eager to make a few extra coins by making a detour slightly out of their usual routine. This did not prove to be as easy as I originally anticipated, as the island seemed to be well known and feared by the local fishermen. With much bartering and a hefty blow to my coffers, I had secured passage to the island the following morning with a young man who looked no older than eighteen. I purchased lodgings in a room above the tavern and eagerly awaited the next day's journey. We departed early the next morning to avoid any unnecessary attention or questions, as the young man was keen to keep his involvement in my mission a secret. As we sailed out into the early morning mist, he furtively looked around for any sign we were being watched. Before long, the little solitary island belonging to the natives was in view, when the boat stopped. I turned frantically to my chaperone and questioned why we were not moving, panic setting in now that I was so close to the end of my journey. He informed me that he would not go any further and demanded I vacate the boat immediately. The confusion on my face was quickly substituted for a look of fear when I saw how far the island was from where we had anchored. Knowing how easily a swimming distance can be miscalculated, as well as the area being renowned for sightings of great white sharks, there was a brief moment of defeat where I contemplated abandoning my quest. Whether it be sheer carelessness or the desire to prove my theory right, I seized my bag from the boat and lowered myself over the side into the cold, unforgiving water. No sooner had I started swimming to the shore, the boat lifted anchor and swiftly retreated back to the mainland. By the time I clambered ashore, some twenty-five minutes later, every muscle in my body was aching, and my breathing was so labored I could scarcely get any air. I had evidently fallen into a catatonic slumber from exhaustion, as, when I next looked up, the sky was a blanket of ebony black, punctuated by the brightest stars I had seen in my thirty-two years of life. My eyes were drawn to a glow amidst the dense trees on the beach's edge, and acrid smoke wafted over me. As I rose to my feet, my legs still in much pain, I stumbled toward the source of the light. Pushing my way through the dense foliage, I came across a clearing some eighty meters in circumference with nothing but a large totem hidden behind a huge, roaring blaze. Looking around nervously for any signs of potential threats, I slowly crept toward the center of the clearing, my nose burning from the bizarre scent of the fire. Once close enough to feel the burn from the fire on my skin, I stopped and was struck with awe by the totem's design. On the body of a man, in likeness to a Grecian god, rested the head of something close to an octopus. 
Its size was grossly disproportionate to the body and had more tentacle-like appendages than a regular octopus. The eyes were large and bulbous and dominated the oblong head, and although it was only a sculpture, they seemed to follow me across the clearing, boring deep into my soul. The figure was wrapped in a large cloak, or so I originally thought, but upon closer inspection, I discovered it was actually a pair of huge wings tipped at the ends with spikes as long as fingers. I stood entranced at the sight of the monument, a feeling of wonderment and apprehension for the craftsmanship battling against a growing sense of dread, terror, and deep unease. Slowly turning to retreat back to the cover of the tree line, I noticed something odd in the fire blazing by the totem. The texture and the way it was bubbling and burning seemed odd for regular kindling or firewood, and many other pieces had a strange uniformity. It was with horror that it dawned on me that I was looking at arms. Human arms. And as this realization set in, more pieces of human anatomy became clear in the blaze. A leg here, a curled up hand with the fingers blazing beneath the nails, and a head so severely burned that it was only identifiable by the positioning of the orifices and the skull. With abject terror, I understood where I was. In the middle of a sacrificial altar, the burning bodies offered to the eldritch being towering above me. I bolted from the clearing and headed back to the relative safety and mundaneness of the beach where I landed. The cloying stink of burning flesh and hair seemed to stick to my body and clothes. The thought of being found by these animalistic natives and offered up as fuel for their fire sent my mind spinning. Working out a rough bearing of my location using the sailor's trick of the North Star, I figured out what should have been the vague direction of the neighboring island that the map indicated in the old man's tale. Sticking close to the shore to remain invisible to the tree line, I headed around the beach to where a rocky cove gave way to a long, natural stone dock. It seemed that this was a regular fishing point for the natives, as there was not only a collection of small canoes, but an assortment of makeshift nets, fishing rods, and spears lying next to crudely woven baskets made from the leaves of the trees lining the beach. On the horizon, outlined by the bright moonlight and innumerable stars, was the outline of a small island not far from where I stood. Surely, this was the fabled island that was the last location of the old man's brother, and the path to the lost city I had searched so long for. Picking my steps carefully, I made my way over the rocks, slipping once, cutting my leg on a jagged piece of slate, and dropping my bag of provisions into the crashing waves below. The bag was a lost cause, and as I had already come so far, and not wanting to risk a chance meeting with the natives, I continued onwards, consequences be damned. Finally reaching the stored boats, I picked the one most suited to my size and one that would be manageable on my own and pushed off from the rocky platform. Yet again, the laws of nature seemed to have been perverted. What appeared to be a reasonably small distance to a small island turned out to be a three-hour battle against the relentless tides. As the landmass grew nearer, I was swallowed by a storm that had appeared from nowhere, the rain coming so thick and heavy that it completely obscured my view of the island. The waves grew to a height that would dwarf most commercial liners, and my canoe was lifted almost entirely into the sky. Crashing down again, the boat splintered beneath me, and I was cast into the unforgiving ocean once more. Tossed around and slammed beneath the waves like a child's toy in a bathtub, I was completely at the mercy of the elements and entirely prepared to meet my mortal end. 
As the last thought of the mysterious city I had fought so hard to find crossed my mind, I was slammed against a hard and entirely solid surface. As my vision returned and my thoughts gathered into something cohesive, I realized I had been deposited on the island of my goal. But more than that, I was standing on a dais before a rough-hewn gateway carved into the mountain before me. Both amazed and confused in equal measure, I was drawn towards the gateway, walking without realizing it, moving beneath the unnatural arch. On the other side of the makeshift entrance were steps carved directly from the stones that seemed to descend into eternity. Starting my descent into the abyss, surrounded by an unshakable feeling of oppression, the air seemed to close in around me as though it wanted to impede my progress. My ears were assaulted by a barely audible thrumming with no natural source, as though the rocks were groaning. I must have descended for what seemed like miles, but I had no way of knowing how far I had gone when the staircase flattened out into a cavernous room. I was surely leagues beneath the sea, but it seemed impossible that anything or anyone could have survived down here, let alone carved such a space beneath the sea. Although no torches or fires were lit, a faint green glow gave just enough light to see the sides of the room, and I could make out four side passages leading from the central chamber. With no clear difference between directions, I chose the passage nearest to myself and proceeded cautiously toward the passageway. My footsteps made no sound as I crossed the room, as though the stone absorbed the noise in an unnatural effort to maintain the silent and oppressive atmosphere. As I drew closer to the corridor, a strong smell of marine life assaulted me. I was immediately reminded of one summer of my youth spent working in a fishing dock, the unmistakable odor of fish entrails and seaweed. Before long, the source of the smell became evident as just through the corridor was an antechamber, seemingly full of rotten carcasses of various sea life. In the faint glow, I could make out everything from mackerel and tuna to larger specimens, such as a porpoise, and even one of the dreaded great whites the area was known for. There was an odd lack of anything resembling an octopus or squid, despite that being one of the more abundant species in the area. Deciding my constitution was not strong enough to bear that offensive smell much longer, I retreated to the main entry cavern to investigate one of the other passageways, taking the corridor opposite to myself. This time there was no smell, but the feeling of oppression grew stronger the further I continued, and the silence seemed to intensify to a point where the absence of any sound was almost deafening itself. The walls were now giving off a strange vibration that had no natural explanation, and I could feel them pushing against me as I continued further. It was as though I was not supposed to be going that way, and as there was nobody to turn me away, the architecture itself was preventing further intrusion. Once more, I was forced to return to my starting place, and I was beginning to lose hope in finding anything of tangible value. Left with a choice of two remaining corridors, I was drawn again across the cavern to the furthest passage from my original entry point, the light seeming brighter now in that direction. Stepping into the stone walkway, I was sure I felt a rumble beneath my feet, but it was so imperceptible that I couldn't be certain it was not my imagination. I then became aware that the carved stone corridor was widening again, and the sides were no longer in reach. Before long, I was again in another tremendous cavern, this one at least double the size of the entry chamber, yet still visible in its entirety due to the bizarre faint glowing emanating from the stones themselves. In the center of the room was another dais, 
perfectly carved stone steps that were made from the darkest obsidian, leading to a pedestal with a single item resting upon it. From this distance, I couldn't make out what it was, but was certain it was something of great importance. I was drawn towards it, as if compelled forwards by an unseen force, and with every step, the strange vibrations in the air intensified until I was at the dais and placed my foot on the first step. The moment I made contact with the obsidian, everything stopped. The vibrations, the faint glowing, the pure existence of everything else ceased. There was nothing but myself and the object in front of me. I could now see it clearly, a perfect miniature representation of the same idol from the native camp. Only this one was carved from the same obsidian stone as the steps, but it had a faint green shimmer that pulsed across the surface. Once more, the eyes of the being bore straight to the center of me, and I was certain there was awareness within the stone, a sentience that could not be explained. My hand reached out to it without even knowing, and I only desired to possess the small carving. Just as my fingers were closing around the statue, something moved in the blackness around me. A large shape, unseen and hidden by the complete dark, swirled past the dais. It was something large, judging by the force of dust it generated as it passed. But again, the silence was deafening. I stood frozen on the spot, fearing to move in case I was to attract the attention of the unknown entity. I then became aware of a new rhythmic chanting penetrating the silent void I found myself in. At first, I couldn't determine what was being said, but the longer I focused, the clearer it became. Ia. Ia, Cthulhu Fatagan. The phrase meant nothing to me, but struck terror into my very core, as though the words held some ancient magic. It was then that I saw it. The sculpture did not do justice to the actual subject's terrifying, unnatural grotesqueness. Looming above me was the tentacled head of the beast, the huge black orbs that were its eyes dominating my will to escape and holding me in place. Its leathery wings spread wide behind it, reaching far beyond what should have been the confines of the room I was in, yet somehow touching only blackness. One clawed hand rose from the void and extended towards me as the chanting reached a crescendo so loud I thought my hearing would never be the same, and my vision began to blur. Finally, my body obeyed my will, and I stumbled backward off the dais, striking my head on the unforgiving stone. Quickly rolling over, I scrambled to my feet not daring to glance behind me for fear of locking eyes with the horrid beast again. At least the chanting had ceased, much to my relief, but had been replaced with a rumbling, different from the sounds issued by the stones themselves. It then dawned on me that I was running through water, and taking a glance at the sides of the passageway, I was alarmed to see water pouring from the cracks in the stonework. To my horror, I could see pieces of the stone falling away, and I feared I would either be buried alive or drowned in this godforsaken underwater abyss. Spurred on by the thought of being buried alive here, with that thing, I sprinted as fast as I could in the murky water filling the passage. I was back at the main entry hall when the water rose to my knees, and a disturbing rumble indicated the closure of one of the passages. I panicked when something approached me through the water. Quickly swiping it away, I realized it was the rotting corpse of a fish. The rapidly rising floodwater had evidently washed the pile of rotten sea life from the first corridor out into the cavern, 
So now I was wading through a cold and rotten swamp. As I climbed the stairs that now looked to ascend right into the heavens, I could feel an immense presence approaching from behind. That was all the motivation I needed to continue my relentless escape from the rising rotten water and the unknown horrors behind me. As hard as I tried, I could not escape the rapid rate of the rising tide, and every step still landed in a sickening crimson splash. As the structure behind me collapsed into the water, I was certain I heard some unintelligible screaming of a beast like none other, the sound reverberating through my ribcage and rattling my bones. As I reached the top of the stairs, I was amazed to find myself mere meters above the surface of the ocean. I now realized that it wasn't that the water was flooding the city, but the city was sinking in its entirety to the depths of the damned sea. This gave me a sense of both elation and terror. It dawned on me that the ungodly being was being dragged to some unknown level of a watery hell. Yet, I was stranded on a rapidly sinking piece of land that was my last hope of survival. As my impending doom sank in, I realized I was clutching the obsidian idol. That blasted, godforsaken idol that was the cause for my approaching damnation. Had I known what trouble the trinket would cause, I would have abandoned this silly quest years ago. But I had to pursue the lure of treasures and fame. I was about to hurl the unholy thing into the ocean, but was stopped by a bizarre sound behind me, and as the stone began to fade beneath the water, a canoe carrying two small men sailed beside me. In one hand, the lead man held a crude wooden flute, now the obvious source of the sound, akin to the music of the seraphim themselves to my ears. I stowed the idol in my pocket, lest the men become disturbed by the thing, and signaled them over to me. They looked at me with both amusement and suspicion, bemused by my foreign clothing and pale skin. They beckoned me aboard their tiny vessel, and, although reluctant, Getting in a boat with these two strangers was infinitely better than the alternative of being stranded in the water with hell knows what below. They steadied the tiny boat as I clambered aboard, my legs shaking with adrenaline and exhaustion, and then headed towards the little island where the sacrificial fire burned what seemed like months ago. The sudden thought crossed my mind that I may be taken back and used as further fuel to keep the blaze going. But as we neared, I could see no sign of the smoke, and no taint of the foul odor from before stained the air. As we docked on the rocky outcrop, the two men disembarked, and I made to follow, but was pushed back onto the seat once more. Apparently, I was no longer permitted onto their island, and was told, in no uncertain gestures, to leave the island towards the mainland. This was not a problem compared to the alternative I had thought may have been coming. I was eager to distance myself as much as possible from the natives and their rituals. Once more, the journey upon the seas was relentless and unforgiving, made all the more harrowing by the thought of an unseen shadow beneath my craft, waiting to drag me to the depths. Just when I thought my body could take me no further, the port came into view, and renewed by the promise of a soft bed and hot food, a surge of energy and determination carried me back to the safety of land and civilized people. My troubles were not over, however, as I realized that, although back to civilization, I had no money, clothes, supplies, or anything other than the souvenir of my trip into the Nightmare City. Fortunately, I could barter passage back to England on the promise of double the ticket fare and a job on the ship as a crewmate. I was happy to be sleeping and working, as I was willing to do anything if it meant leaving this cursed part of the world behind. I was exhausted that first night on the ship, 
The strain of the past few days caught up with me all at once. The moment I lay down on the board that was a poor substitute for a bed, I was swallowed by a blackness that equaled the void within that city of stone beneath the waves. I was surrounded by nothing. No sound, no light, no sense of direction or momentum. Simply existing in a void of nothing. Then, the flash of movement, followed by the rush of air and panic, flooded my every fiber. I was there again, standing before the altar on the obsidian stone, being circled by that ungodly creature. I turned to run, or at least tried to, but my feet found no purchase. I was flailing in place like a marionette operated by a child. Then, it was there. Those bulbous eyes, the leathery wings and the clawed talon reaching to envelop me once more. I jolted awake and found myself drenched from head to toe in sweat, the sheets thrown to the floor, my heart pounding so hard in my chest I thought it might crack a rib. I would find no further peace that night, and sought out the ship crew's supervisor and begged for some busy work to occupy myself. Each night, the same nightmare, if it could be called such, as I was never truly sure if I was sleeping, found me in a state of panic and distress. My nerves had become increasingly shredded, to the point that each shadow that crossed my vision became a wing or a talon, or God forbid, that unnaturally shaped head. After seeing my increasingly decaying state, the crew's supervisor became concerned and thought I was overworking myself, consigning me to stay in the ship's hospital wing. There, I was administered a combination of medication and balms to break the now constant fever that gripped me. Yet all this did was prolong the time I was trapped in that nameless void. The visions of that beast lasted longer and longer, until I could see every detail and unnatural form, even in my waking hours. I remained under the care of the ship's doctors until we docked back in the port at Liverpool, where I was promptly transferred to the care of a trained psychiatrist and taken into protective care. Evidently, I had been rambling and muttering words within my stupor upon the ship, and had displayed signs of a broken and shattered mind, enough to convince the crew I was a danger to myself and others. Despite my protestations, the doctors and psychiatrists were adamant that I needed further care, and were most intrigued by the odd figure they had recovered from my person. Although reluctant to divulge the details of my expedition for fear of confirming their suspicions of my insanity, I believed it to be the only way to escape my new captivity. I described my journey as far as the moment when I seized one of the natives' boats, and from that point concocted a fiction of finding the bizarre artifact on a beach and then passing out from heat exhaustion. The babbling of my journey on the boat resulted from fevered dreaming influenced by the unusual design of the sculpture on my overworked and exhausted mind. This seemed to be a sufficient explanation, and once I got back to my full strength, they were prepared to release me into my care and permitted my return home. The dreams, however, had not ceased and I was still plagued by the horrifying visage of that eldritch monster each night. I've scarcely had any peace since my time in the sunken city, and have found my every waking moment tormented by thoughts, images, and smells from that damned place. I fear for my sanity, and can no longer continue with the curse that this blasted trinket has come with. And so... I intend to retrace my steps, as mad as that may seem, to return the idol to the sea where it belongs. My hopes are that upon casting the sculpture back to where it came from, 
I may be released from this torment and find some semblance of ordinary life. I have no idea whether I may be able to find the island again, or if I will have the nerve to go through with my plan. I feel a constant presence behind me, and every time I close my eyes, I may be dragged through the veil into that nether place. So I leave here a full account of my journey, as both a warning and evidence that although the city may remain in some state beneath the sea, no man should ever venture to find it, lest they discover more than they bargain for and pay the price they may not afford. Beware the city beneath the sea, for though its treasures call to thee, a being sleeps and lies in wait to devour thy soul and seal thy fate. This episode of Horror Hill is proudly brought to you by June's Journey. This new chapter I'm on is the prettiest yet, I'd say. The scenery is amazing. It's chapter 17, and it's called The Deadly Affair, Scandalous. Let me tell you more about the game. You and I play the starring role, June Parker, an amateur detective investigating the death of her sister. Set back in the roaring 20s, you'll investigate thousands of beautiful settings from all over the world. You'll collect clues, solve mysteries, and be rewarded handsomely all the way. Not only that, but you have to search these elaborate scenes for items that aren't that big. You get the deal. This is on your PC or mobile device, of course. Real life is uh, a little more up in the air. June's Journey is the perfect game for any mystery lover. It's got all the danger, romance, and intrigue you crave, but in a laid-back, easy-going atmosphere with a great storyline, your observational skills will carry the day. And depending on what you're in the mood for, it's full of fun features to keep you entertained. I like playing during the day, on downtime periods. Maybe finding my next lead before I conclude the day. And all the better, because tomorrow evening, June and I are back on the job. Just like Sherlock Holmes himself once said, these hidden objects don't find themselves. In that spirit, I implore you to accept my challenge. Play to at least chapter two of June's journey and see if you don't prefer the 20s of old. Pick up where you left off to uncover new secrets or start your investigation today and download June's journey. Available on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as on PC through Facebook games. Thank you for your support, and for supporting our valuable sponsors. You've been listening to The Sunken City by Matt Howes. Matt Howes lives in the Midlands, United Kingdom, with his long-term partner, Emma, and their daughter, Vanessa. Heavily inspired by the horror masters such as Lovecraft, King, Barker, and Poe, this is his first in the intended collection of short stories from his not quite Nomicon, a fitting tribute to the Elder Gods. When not lost in the world of writing, he can often be found lost in the world of video games, most often the universe of Fallout, Diablo, or the heavily history-influenced Assassin's Creed games. Fuck! James yelled as he accidentally stepped in the red, greasy mound of burst guts and matted fur next to his broken-down car. 
As if being stuck in the middle of nowhere, cooking in the oppressive summer heat wasn't bad enough, James had just stepped in roadkill. He lifted his foot out of the pile of viscera, shaking loose tiny bits of gore from the sole of his shoe as he did so. The stench of the rotting, pancaked creature wafted up to his nostrils due to this action, and James retched. He silently cursed himself for not getting that check engine light looked at sooner. However, the self-reprimanding moment didn't last long, as James remembered that it wasn't his fault the check engine light wasn't looked at. He didn't have any extra money to get his car looked at these days, barely had money to pay his rent and keep his cupboard full of instant ramen these days. Every dime he had went to Amy. Their divorce had not been amicable, and Amy had gone through the legal system to ensure that James would be supporting her, and their son Tyler, for many years to come. That cunt, James thought. James could sense himself growing angry and tried to calm himself down. He was already in a bad enough situation without losing his temper even though it was that bitch's fault he was even on the road in the first place. If she hadn't been so insistent about him taking Tyler this weekend, he never would have made this trip. She fought so hard to get sole custody. What the fuck did she care whether or not he skipped a visitation day? James covered his nose with the back of his hand and inspected the bottom of his shoe. Though now stained a bit brownish red, He had managed to shake most of the mess off. He peered down and inspected the carcass. It was impossible to determine what the animal had once been. It was now little more than a crushed mass of brownish fur and bright red chunks. It looked like it had been run over again and again. James guessed they only did a little cleaning on this road. He wiped the sweat from his brow and looked around. No cars were coming from either direction. James knew this road was isolated. All that surrounded either side of the offbeat highway were acres of empty farmland, a sea of dry grass with the occasional scattered pile of hay or large bush, surrounded by rotting and broken fence posts. Not far in the distance, James could barely make out a presumably long-abandoned farmhouse opposite what appeared to be a silo with a caved-in roof. It had been a long time since anyone had tended to that farm. James stopped daydreaming and came back to his current situation. The sun beat down on the back of his neck. He had been so close to his destination when the engine gave out. Only ten or so miles. He needed to get there. Things would only get worse if he kept Amy and Tyler waiting. James pensively pulled his cell phone from his pocket. Though he was trying to remain calm, he couldn't help but open his voicemail and listen once again to the angry message he'd received from Amy earlier that morning. Be a fucking man for once in your life and come pick Tyler up like you're supposed to. Jesus fucking Christ, James, you only get him one weekend a month, and you're trying to get out of it? Her voice erupted from the phone's speaker, and James quickly exited the playback. He'd already played it repeatedly throughout the day, his rage simmering. That wasn't the reason he'd pulled his phone out to begin with. Why was he torturing himself, listening to what that stupid whore thought? James gripped the phone tightly as he thought of Amy, living it up on the gorgeous property just outside the city that he'd worked so hard for, while he wasted away in a shitty apartment. Probably fucking a different guy every night, trying to find a new daddy for Tyler. The two of them should have had the foresight to understand that, beyond humping and coming, they didn't have much in common. Their lives would have been so much easier if they'd recognized the early stages of their courtship for what it was. A series of good fucks, nothing more. But sometimes, good pussy and good dick can cause people to not think properly. 
You feel good at that moment, and you forget that you don't feel good all the time. And it only gets worse when you waste money on a wedding and then bring an annoying, mouth-breathing little fuck of a child into the world. As much as James grew to detest Amy, it hadn't been gradual with Tyler. James regretted it the second he pumped Tyler into his mother. And it did only take a second. James had never quite been a star in that department. God, he thought. If I had a time machine, I'd go back with a pair of scissors and give myself a fucking vasectomy on the spot. James remembered the reason he'd pulled out his cell phone. A tow truck. Was it worth it? Never mind paying for it. He couldn't afford to stand around for hours waiting. He was not leaving his car on the side of the road for that long. Walking was out of the question. The nearest civilization was still miles away. The stench of the roadkill that had become acquainted with James's foot wafted up to him yet again, and he wished the car would turn on so he could sit in the air conditioning. James's mind drifted to dead things again, and he recalled the sheer volume of roadkill he'd seen on the drive before his engine had died. Come to think of it, it had seemed like piles of gore littered the road every few feet, mashed up small animal corpses driven repeatedly into a hairy paste in excessive numbers. James knew that he couldn't sit here all day. Apprehensively, he resigned himself to the fact that calling for a tow was his only option. James dialed the number and waited, again wiping his sweat-slick forehead. Nothing. James had yet to receive reception on this stretch of road. Fuck! James yelled again. He kicked the passenger door of his beige sedan, causing the propped-up hood to wiggle dangerously. He stomped his feet on the hot asphalt and swore some more. I am well and truly fucked, James thought. He put his head in his hands and leaned against the car. His shirt clung to his back, damp with sweat and left a faint moist streak on the door as James slid to sit on the sizzling blacktop. He wished he knew the first thing about cars, wished there was something he could do besides stare impotently at the guts under his car's propped hood. He looked at his watch. 6.45. The hot summer sun would be setting soon. James contemplated cutting his losses and walking to the gas station he had passed a few miles back when he heard the first thwack. James's head snapped in the direction of the sound. A massive figure was in the distance, far down the desolate highway, but close enough that James could still make it out. James stood to his feet and strained his eyes to see the person in the distance. It appeared to be a man wearing a red flannel shirt and denim jeans. He carried some bundle in his left hand, dangling from a string. Something appeared to be covering the man's face. Holy shit, James thought. That is one big fucker. James was six foot two. And even from this distance, he could tell that the flannel-shirted man was far taller. However, even more perplexing than the man's hulking size was the action he was performing. The man was furiously jumping up and down in place, stomping both feet hard simultaneously as he came down out of the air. James heard the rhythmic thumping of massive boots on asphalt as he watched the man repeat the action again and again. Abruptly, the man stopped jumping and walked several feet forward. James had all but forgotten his current predicament at this point. He was entranced by the strange behavior of what he presumed to be a giant retarded hillbilly. The man stopped, a bit closer to the side of the road this time, and grabbed one of the items dangling from the bundle. He raised it above his head and slammed it hard into the ground. Thwack! 
James winced at the closer, louder sound. It sounded like wet meat. The ritual was repeated as the man spent nearly a minute stomping on the object he'd thrown. James saw bits and pieces flying into the air as the man's jumping forged a misshapen lump beneath his feet. The stomping stopped and the man began walking closer to the broken car. All the color drained from James's face as he could make out better not only the man's physical features, but also what dangled from his left hand. Though the man looked pale from a distance, close up his skin was downright pallid, creamy grayish. Deep, poorly healed scars ran up and down his muscular arms. The tattered and filthy sleeveless flannel left little of the man's hideous physique to the imagination. What was left to James's imagination was the man's face. Over his head, the man wore a beige burlap sack tied tightly around the neck with a thin piece of rope. Two jagged eye holes were ripped into the rough material. As much as the image of a seven-foot-tall, gray-skinned hillbilly wearing a potato sack mask terrified James, what the man grasped in his enormous gray claw was even worse. Hanging by their hair were two human heads, the skin of their faces removed to reveal the wet, red muscle beneath. Their eyes were gone as well leaving only gaping black sockets. There didn't seem to be any teeth in their mouths either. Everything but the hair, it seemed, had been carved away. James was trying to process the horror in front of him as the man raised one of the severed heads, appearing to belong to a woman judging by the long blonde hair above his own. He slammed it on the ground with another loud thwack. James's eyes widened as he realized what was about to happen. The bag-faced man leapt up in the air and brought his enormous, crimson-stained boots down hard on the head. Immediately, the skinned face caved like a rotten watermelon. James heard the cracking of the skull much more clearly now and could do nothing but watch as the man reduced the head to a mashed-up pile of hair and gore. A sickening thought crept into James's head as he slowly gazed down at the pile of roadkill near his car, the one he had stepped in just minutes ago. Slower still, he looked back the way he'd come before his car had broken down, faintly making out the piles of days-old roadkill that littered the highway. Before the next thought could enter James's head, he heard the loudest thwack yet. He looked back to see the masked man standing mere feet from where he stood. As the man reduced yet another human being's violated skull to a heap of mush, James could only stare, his sweat-soaked shirt clinging wetly to his back. Frozen in fear, James could do nothing as the man performed his morbid exercise. Once the final head had been suitably crushed, the masked man turned sharply to face James, apparently aware of his presence all along. The man pointed a massive finger at the pile of flesh at his feet. He pointed at the roadkill near where James stood. He turned and gestured toward the miles of highway ahead. James's terror turned to confusion. This maniac was creating roadkill using human heads. Now he was trying to show it off? James shrugged his shoulders confusedly, careful not to make any aggressive movements. The bag-faced lunatic grunted and pointed at the roadkill again, the motion seeming sharper and more aggravated this time. James was lost. The man moved his face mere inches from James, yellow eyes set in jagged holes staring deep into James's. He grunted again, 
louder and now clearly agitated. I don't... James trailed off. What the fuck do you want me to do? Don't fucking hurt me, man. I won't tell anybody about this shit. The gray man interrupted James by suddenly grabbing him with a ragged hand. Effortlessly, he swung James to the ground, nearly sticking his face in the pile of gore. James gagged as the stench invaded his nostrils. He tried not to think about what the roadkill had been mere minutes before. After a few moments of holding him near the mess, the man yanked James back to his feet and tossed him toward the car's hood. James stumbled, steadying himself against the front bumper as the rod holding the hood open desperately tried to stabilize it. The two stared at each other for a long moment. Again, the man looked at James almost expectantly. Now, sick to his stomach from the smell and unsteady on his feet due to being physically manhandled, James was even less sure what this behemoth wanted. After some time had passed, the masked man reached behind his back and produced a large, rusted blade. James's jaw dropped. The gray man took a step forward, and James's brain turned back on. He turned and made a beeline for the decrepit farmland opposite the highway. Fuck Amy, he thought, as he weaved around the car and attempted to steady his shaking legs. It was her fault that he was in this fucking mess, being chased by a masked lunatic in the middle of nowhere. He heard a deep, guttural roar of anger from behind him as he broke into a sprint. James was still determining what he'd accomplished by reaching that old farmhouse in the distance, but he figured it was better than waiting to see what the man would do with that knife. James had been an athlete in school, but years of a sedentary lifestyle had caught up with him. He was already feeling winded, and the farmhouse still seemed miles away. James didn't have to look back to know the man was close. He could hear the heavy footsteps the almost inhuman grunting. He had caught the man off guard by running in the first place, but he was already losing his head start. James tripped as he tried to formulate the best plan to avoid having his head chopped off and the skin removed from his face. Tumbling head over heels, he skidded to a halt in the dry grass a few feet from the object that had caused him to fall, a weather-worn metal pitchfork discarded in the past by some unknown hay-baling farmhand. The masked man had not been far behind, and James looked up to see him casually walking toward James's prone body. Thinking fast, James grabbed the pitchfork and stabbed forward hard with it as he rose to his feet. The man hadn't seen what James tripped on and was surprised by the rusted blades piercing the flesh of his abdomen. An inhuman howl of pain escaped the man's covered lips as he staggered backwards. James stabbed with the pitchfork again, striking higher up on the man's chest and digging the farm tool deeper. He tried to yank it free to take another jab, but it was stuck in the man's gray flesh. The masked man slashed with his dagger at James's arm, cutting deep into his wrist. James screamed and fell back, crimson blood gushing from the deep gouge. If the blade had gone any deeper, James wondered if his hand would have been severed from his forearm. James lay there, clutching the wound, expecting the killing blow to come. Instead, he heard soft whimpering. He slowly stood yet again and saw the gray man on his knees, blood seeping from the two pitchfork-inflicted wounds, the weapon still jutting from his pectoral muscle. He was injured. James knew he had to think fast. The car was still no good, and he doubted he could make it to that gas station in this shape. The house was still his best bet. Maybe he could dress his wound. Slowly, putting as much pressure as possible on his wrist, James half-walked, half-ran toward the dilapidated farmhouse. 
He glanced back at the masked man, still kneeling in the grass, breathing sharply. The long handle of the pitchfork jutted from the man's chest and touched the ground, propping him up like a tent pole. Eventually, James reached the front door of the farmhouse. It was already hanging off its hinges, and even in his wounded state, James kicked it open easily. The inside of the house was as run down as the exterior, peeling paint, holes in the walls, and piles of garbage and other debris littering the floors. James noticed a large mass of trash and what appeared to be mattress cushioning in the middle of the floor. A nest? Jesus fucking Christ, James thought. That fucking maniac lives here. A jolt of pain caused James to remember his slashed wrist, and he looked around for something to dress the wound. Everything in the house looked unsanitary, but James decided to survive the night and deal with any potential infection later. Cautiously, he began wandering around the disgusting living room, half expecting something to pounce at him, camouflaged and waiting in the mounds of garbage. James found a tattered tablecloth near the base of the stairs that appeared intact, but filthy. With effort, he was able to wrap it around his wrist and tie it tightly. His entire arm ached. There had been rust on the blade. Hopefully, this would get him through the night. James knew he would have to pass the gray man again on the way back to his car, and began looking around for something to defend himself with on the off chance that the freakish redneck had somehow survived. There wasn't anything useful in the living room. The filthy kitchen was only full of more detritus and a massive refrigerator that appeared sealed shut with some brown slime. Apprehensively, James decided to head upstairs. The stairs looked about as well-maintained as the rest of the house, which wasn't saying much, but it was worth a shot. The sun was beginning to set. James didn't want to be stuck in this house in the dark on top of everything else. Carefully, he started up the stairs. There had only been a slight stench in the living room, but the smell only amplified as James made his way to the top floor of the house. Originally thinking it was the garbage that filled the living room, James now recognized the smell as dried blood and rot. Based on the day's events so far, James had a bad feeling about what he would find up there. Much like the downstairs, the upstairs of the farmhouse was torn apart and strewn with garbage. There was a room with a closed door at the end of the hall. The other rooms only had open doorways leading to the mess within. James took a quick look inside each, finding only more disarray and detritus. There was no rhyme or reason to the mess. It was a mixture of random objects like torn books, broken children's toys, empty takeout containers, and cracked computer monitors. Each room looked like someone had sliced open several trash bags and poured the contents onto the floor. Inside the bathroom was a cracked porcelain tub, overflowing with some stinking, soupy black liquid, and a medicine cabinet filled with expired pills. The smell of death grew even stronger as James approached the closed door. He knew that he had to go in. He pushed the door open. Fuck, he whispered, too shocked to even react to the oppressive stench of decay that now blasted him in the face. The room was filled with corpses in varying stages of decomposition, women, men, and children alike. Most were headless, leaning against walls or stacked in piles. Dried blood caked the floor, and chunks of gore were scattered everywhere. Under a large, curtained window on the far wall was a wooden table upon which a body was laid, with its head still attached. On the floor next to it was what appeared to be a bucket of carving tools. 
Unable to stop himself, James covered his nose and slowly walked into the room. Upon entering, James noted a crude bookshelf against the east wall, lined with severed heads. The roadkill supplies, James thought. Trying not to step in any of the greasy viscera that covered the floor, James stopped at the table, looking down at the corpse. It was a young, red-headed woman. Her skin was pale, lips purple. She hadn't quite begun decomposing yet. How new was this one? James noticed the large gash on her freckled chest between her breasts, and his eyes wandered down the rest of her body. She was covered in bruises and gouges. She had suffered. He thought of Amy. The rage he'd felt towards her that day couldn't escape him, even in a life-or-death scenario. He looked once more at the ghoulish bookcase and saw what appeared to be a young child's head. A dark-haired boy. He thought of Tyler. He thought of his wife and son in a room like this. Suddenly, James heard footsteps below him. He froze. There was only one person those heavy steps could belong to. How the fuck was that goddamn freak still alive? James needed to think fast. He reached into the bucket and pulled out a blood-stained meat cleaver. He stepped past the table and drew the curtains. The window oversaw a small portion of the roof. James wondered if he could make the drop from the roof to the ground without shattering his ankle. James heard the man's footsteps clomping up the stairs. It would take a little while for him to be found. James opened the window, straining to exert any energy with his injured arm. As James was halfway out the window, the gray man's massive frame filled the doorway. James turned to stare at the man, who let out a primal scream as he charged toward the carving table, blood still oozing from the wounds on his abdomen. James flung himself from the window, barely managing to land on the rooftop. He looked over the edge. The drop was more than several feet. James hesitated. He turned to see the gray man's filthy paw reaching through the window, clawing at him angrily. God fucking damn it! James yelled. He jumped. James hit the ground with a thud. He attempted to roll and hold onto the cleaver at the same time. As he tumbled, the cleaver flew out of his hand. James rolled over his bad arm and screeched in pain. He looked around desperately for the cleaver. It had gone flying. There was no time for him to search any longer. He had to run. James took off in a mad dash back the way he came. Maybe he could get the old piece of shit car to start? Maybe he could outrun the maniac behind him and get to that gas station. He could get reception on his phone and be able to call. He couldn't finish the thought as he heard a series of grunts and screams behind him. James didn't need to look back to know the masked man was on his tail again. He tried to increase his speed while also glancing at the ground in front of him so he wouldn't trip again. It was dark out by now, but James could still make out his car shining in the moonlight. He knew the gray man was right behind him, but his body was on fire. Out of breath, he attempted to catch his wind by leaning against the trunk for a brief moment. He heard the scream and got out of the way just as the masked man slammed his enormous fists in an attack aimed at James. The man missed, and the impact of the blow caused the car to shift and bounce off the pavement, denting the car's chassis where the hit had connected. The hood slammed shut as the supporting rod snapped from the impact. James turned to run again, sticking his foot in a pile of greasy gore as he did so. Unable to control his momentum, James slipped on the roadkill, 
landing hard on the ground as he lost his balance. Before he had a chance to react, the gray man picked him up and tossed him hard at the car's trunk. James bounced off the broken down vehicle and hit the ground with a thud. The gray man picked him up by the neck and began repeatedly slamming James's face into the already dented trunk. Blood erupted from James's nose, and he saw white. He thought he felt a tooth go loose. The repeated impact eventually caused the trunk to pop open, and the gray man threw his broken victim aside as he noticed the trunk's contents. The stench of hot, decaying meat wafted from the trunk, escaping into the night sky. Inside the trunk were two corpses, a middle-aged brunette woman and a young boy. They both wore dark ligature marks around their necks. Their eyes were cloudy. The gray man focused his yellow eyes on the bodies. I had to. The delirious man spoke from the ground. He spat out a glob of blood and coughed. The gray man turned to face him as he spoke. James wasn't speaking to him, though. He wasn't speaking to anyone. That fucking cunt was stealing my money, stealing my life, making my fucking life miserable. She deserved it. She deserved it. A lot of things had gone wrong for James that day. Losing his cool at the house after he'd arrived to pick up Tyler had been the beginning of a long day of fuck-ups. Before he'd realized what he'd done, he'd strangled his ex-wife, and unfortunately had to do the same to silence his screaming, traumatized son. His biggest regret was his car breaking down before he'd made it to the even more isolated patch of farmland where he'd planned to dump the bodies. James was losing consciousness. He heard a ringing in his ears, and every part of his body throbbed, especially his bleeding wrist. The last thing he saw was the gray man standing over him. Those cold yellow eyes held him as the artist drew his rusted blade and went to work. Dale was pissing into a bottle as he and Earl soared down the highway in their tanker. Careful, fuck nuts, Earl said. Don't get any piss on the seat. Dale rolled his eyes. He glanced out the window. Sure is a ton of roadkill around here, huh? I didn't think many people really drove on this road. Earl took a quick glance out the window himself. He had to admit that the road was absolutely swarmed with pulpy piles of gore. He shrugged. Wonder what all the different animals there are out here, Dale said, his eyes still glued to the window. As they passed a junked-out beige sedan in a field a few yards from an abandoned farmhouse, Dale noticed an odd cluster of roadkill. Three small mounds of flesh, gory red paste mixed with matted brown hair, arranged in a straight line. Looks like somebody hit a whole pack of squirrels at once or something right there, Dale said, pointing as he shook the last few drops of urine loose. Earl didn't take his eyes off the road. Squirrels don't run in packs, fuckface. You've been listening to Road Killer by Getty Cahoon. Getty Cahoon is a pro wrestler and author with a love of telling stories, either in the ring or on the page. An avid reader of greats like Joe R. Lansdale and Bentley Little from the impressionable age of 10, Getty eventually graduated to other mediums of horror, and the genre permeates almost every facet of his life. There's very little that Getty enjoys more than being scared, except maybe for scaring others. 
Well, folks, that wraps up tonight's episode. Be sure to join us next week at the same time and place for more spooky stories, frightening fables, and chilling tales. All of that good stuff. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's episode was hosted by, and its featured tale performed by, yours truly, Eric Peabody. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Nikki McSorley and Eric Peabody. Finalization by Craig Groshek and S.K. Brown. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your work considered for future production. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, please subscribe to us to make sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on social media to connect any time and get the latest updates on this and our other programs. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit the thumbs up button to let us know how we're doing and leave us a kind comment. Lastly, Don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archives and ad-free downloads of all of your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, you can hear more of my work on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights podcast. However, I will be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.